Welcome to episode number 25 of Reflections from WT, the heart and soul of the Texas Panhandle. My name is Randy Ray. I'm the director of broadcast engineering here on the campus. And today I am joined by Dr. Walter Windler, the 11th president of West Texas A&M University, and my good friend, Dr. Marty Coleman. Good morning, morning. gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. morning. Good to be here. I, uh, I, I, I'm really excited talking to Dr. Coleman today because he and I have a, a bit of a history together. Uh, not only are you a history professor here on campus, but you spend a lot of time over here at the campus radio station. Yeah, and so uh, we've we've hung out a lot together. I was I was I have in front of me a copy of your book Always WT, and I noticed that you graduated first from from West Texas State University in eighty three eighty four. And now we might even have a history there because I, I know I it. That's what I, that's what I was saying. I graduated in '84, so both oh you and God. I were hanging out at West Texas State <laughs> yeah, University a, back in the That's 80s. a frightening <laughs> thought, right there. We might even have done a radio. We may but. have. We may have. Um, I need to. I need to dig in some of the archives and see if I can yeah. find that. Yeah, Doctor Coleman, there's a lot going on in our world today, and a lot. Go- and I know that you have spent a lot of time researching. And I, I know that your expertise is in uh, women's suffrage and also integration. Um, let's talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about the, the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. When I was doing research uh, that here at WT, there was a suffrage league in 1911, you know, and that was actually one of the few suffrage leagues in Texas at that time. There was no major state one. Uh, there was one at UT, I believe, maybe one at Baylor and one in Austin. But other than that, you know, and that, so there was a lot, a lot here. And actually, actually, they had a debate, a debate between women really of pro-suffrage and anti-suffrage in 1912. Actually, we wanted to re- redo that debate. Uh, of course, all this happened, so we can't redo it. But, you know, it was good. And and in the middle of the debate, actually, a male student came in dressed like old men, and they were carrying baby dolls. And they said, oh, don't don't make us do this and all that. So Crazy times, yeah. Yeah, it was <laughs> But, but don't you think that WC was kind of on the uh, cutting edge of suffrage? Uh, really, somewhat. They were out there. I mean, there was this group. Uh, I don't know how many was in this group, but there was that. Uh, WT, of course, WT, when they started, was a normal college, which was for training teachers. So actually, women made up the majority of the student body is about at least 70 percent female at that time and up until world war ii actually uh and until the end of world war ii when the gis came back that women always were in the majority dr winler is that the case now yes it is uh more women than men um it's uh it's over half um well, obviously, if it's going to be more women than men, it'd be over half. But and I don't know, I don't have the exact numbers. I should know them, but I don't. But it's over half. And and I think part of it is because what Marty just talked about this uh, commitment to 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 educating educators. Mm-hmm. Um, you've heard me say before that about seventy two or three percent of the primary and secondary educators and administrators in the top twenty six counties have at least one. A degree or certification from West Texas A&M University. We educate the Panhandle. That's 2020, but we educated the Panhandle the day Way the back. door opened. I mean, that's what we were about. And uh, you know, it's a, it's it doesn't surprise me in some ways, and I guess it would surprise some people because they think, well, we're so very conservative and so on up here, which we are. I mean, that's there's no question about it. But this is a uh, culture where it's performance that matters. And I think if a if, um, hundred years ago, if a woman was a good teacher, apart from the fact that that was traditionally a, a, a women's discipline, especially in primary school, uh, that they would succeed and they'd be treated seriously based on performance. Because mm-hmm. that's, the, to me, the pragmatism of the panhandle. I think it, you know, it, it, it says, look, we need to get a job done. 
who's the most fit person to get the job done? And by golly, I, I think that aspect of our history, among many others that Marty so uh, carefully uh, uh, charts and records in Always WT, um, which is a great book on the history of, of uh, West Texas, what's now West Texas A&M University, um, you know, it's, it's important that we have always, in a sense, been practically minded making a difference in society. And I think that's really important. And it comes through in, the, in uh, Marty's work, I think, very nicely. Yeah. We mentioned how WT started as a teacher's college. Marty, I want to ask you, what's your favorite thing about teaching? Uh, I would have to say, well, interaction with students, obviously. And, you know, it's, it's I guess, that you know something that you can give them and they seem excited when they find it out. And, you know, so it doesn't get old, you know, you're yeah. always, always putting this to fresh minds or whatever. And, and you keep learning yourself, learning about things. Yeah. Yeah. Do- Dr. Wonder, you've taught in the past. You ever miss that? Uh, only every day. I, <laughs> I really love to teach. And for the same reasons that Marty has just articulated, you have an impact on people. And, and you do your best to have it be a positive uh, impact. But, and Marty just said this, you're always learning. I used to tell students, I taught design studios for years at LSU and at Texas A&M, and towards the end of my career in Southern Illinois, at Southern Illinois too. And I used to tell students, I, you know, I feel like a thief when I come into this classroom. I come to give you guys something, and I use guys in the New York, uh, you know, it's a, it's a non-gender term. It's just a, you yeah. people, I give you guys a, um, I come here to do that, to share something with you. But the fact of the matter is, I always get more than you. Nobody leaves this mm-hmm. room with a greater change in, in what they could have learned today than I do which is a strange thing. And, I, and I've always had a, I, you know, a love for that. I just love it. I love being around students, and I appreciate them very much. Just well, like I, I will tell you this as my boss. I, I do the teaching for free. It's all the other stuff that I have to do that you're paying <laughs> yeah, me for. Yeah, so. I understand that. That's <laughs> exactly right. Filling out forms and, uh, you know, assigning grades and all yeah, that. Yeah, going to meetings and yeah, all that Yeah, all stuff, the yeah. meetings. Yeah, yeah. As I mentioned at the top of the podcast, our world is in a strange place right now. Marty, and I, and I know your background and your expertise, and if I'm not mistaken, your dissertation was on civil rights. What do you, what's going on right now with civil rights? Are we in a good place? Are we in a bad place? How do we, how do we make sense of all that? Uh, to make sense of it would, I mean, it's, it's difficult to understand. I think that, you know, we are having to come to grips with the, with our past, with, uh, you know, how minorities have been treated in our country, and it's coming to a head right now, and we have to, it's, we have to make a decision. We have to, you know, say, okay, we're going to change Robert E. Lee High School or mm-hmm. change Edmund Pettus Bridge, uh, things like that. We, and that's, you know, people have to come to grips with their history, and that's what that history shows them that there's a lot that was done, you know, that is coming to a boil right now. Yeah, well, like like women's suffrage, WT also was a bit on the cutting edge of integration. Tell us about Joe Kerbel and his role in WT integration. Well, Joe Kerbel was uh, very important in that. Of course, Joe Kerbel... He was the coach of the, the Buffs, the football team. And in 1960, he came here from Tech. And, of course, you know, Tech, like other schools in, in the South, really uh, most other colleges, white colleges, did not, would not play African Americans on the team. Uh, Kerbal said, you know, that, hey, we're going to win, and that's what we're going to do. And so he said, yeah, I'm going to start recruiting, and he did start to recruit players. Uh, first, of course, Pistol P. Pedro, yeah. of course, a famous running back uh, for WT. Actually came here from a junior college in Colorado, 
and you know just made a big impact because he was such a big player. Actually, it's kind of interesting, you know, when he went to recruit, uh, Pedro was from Massachusetts, and he went to recruit, and Pedro's mother said, well, you know, I don't know if I want to send my son to Texas, you know, all that uh, going on, and he'll have to sit in the back of the bus and all that. And Joe Kerbel uh, said, well, if your son can run the way they say he can sit on my lap in the front of the bus. So, uh, so uh, he's, uh, he was, you know, very important when, and there were people, of course, who wouldn't have done that, you know. Yeah. Actually, uh, Pedro played a game in 62, I believe, against Tech. It's one of the last games WT played with Tech. And, uh, uh, tech, you know, still had the habit, really, of not playing teams with African Americans, or at least not in Lubbock. And uh, he was there, and I think he uh, he was half Puerto Rican, so that's why he may have have got by there. Yeah. But anyway, he uh, led the Buffs to a victory, you know, thirty to twenty seven, which was a big deal. He led him to a victory in the Sun Bowl, you know. So one of the bowl games that WT has played in. Interesting, uh, interesting history about WT, and I'm 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 proud of the fact that WT not only led the charge for women's suffrage, but also integration. We're going to take a break real quick, and when we come back, I want to talk to both of you about your time in a monastery. <laughs> we'll be back in about sixty seconds. West Texas A&M University is a student body that learns by doing and is always seeking opportunity. Talented and accomplished faculty that teach both in and out of the classroom. Programs that provide timeless information and meet the challenges of today's world. Facilities rich in technology as well as WT history. It's our alumni and donors that make the big difference and set us apart from other universities. With your support, WT will continue to award scholarships to deserving students and strengthen our programs, which means a better campus, more in-depth education, and a lasting cultural and economic impact on our region. Now is the time to strengthen connections support students, and open doors for tomorrow's leaders. Share your experience, share your heritage, share your pride. All right, welcome back to the podcast. I, I mentioned before we went to our break that uh, both of you guys have uh, spent some time in a monastery. And that may be misleading a little bit, but uh, it's because you, you were both on a study abroad trip. Dr. Winler, tell us about your experience well, we, uh, I uh, took uh, 75, myself and another faculty member uh, from Landscape Architecture and I and a couple of graduate students took 75 uh, Texas Aggies uh, to uh, Feline Valdarno, which is about 45 kilometers south of Florence on the Arno River. Uh, and it was what's what's called a ghetto program. You know, we stayed in a place all together. We didn't, you know, and that we had class. We had studios there. We had classes there, and we all slept there and ate there and so on. And uh, there were there was eighty of us basically uh, there and seventy five students. And uh, there were four priests that still ran the monastery and took care of you. Yeah, yeah they kind of kind of took care of us. They uh, and they they uh, but they were. Well, I'll tell you what, they were capitalists. I, <laughs> they charge for everything, you know. Yeah. You wanted to shine your shoes, they do it for a buck and a half or whatever. I mean, it was it was kind of I mean, that's a silly example, but they did charge for everything, uh, and they were good business people. And the fact of the matter is, we had a I think from their perspective, especially a good experience, and most of our students had a good experience. Yeah, um, well, it was interesting. Doctor Coleman and I taught a class with probably a couple years ago about uh, British cultural influences. And one of the places we stayed in Oxford was at an Anglican monastery. And it was, it was fun. We had, it, was, it was completely different from one of the other places we stayed, which was a um, hostel 
the hostel and the monastery, two completely different experiences <laughs> for our students. Um, One was all rules and the other was no rules. I'm exactly. Sure. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Dr. Coleman, I'm going to ask you, how important is studying abroad to a student? I think that, you know, study abroad gives, you know, just people a chance to see the world and say, hey, the world is a lot bigger mm-hmm. than the panhandle of Texas. And, yep. you know, people, there are good people that have totally different thoughts than I have. So I can't just say that, you know, other people are, uh, for example, snowflakes or whatever, that I should say, hey, everybody has a voice and I I want to, it broadens their minds. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, I wish that we could require every student to study abroad. And I know it's really expensive for some folks, but I, yeah. I agree with you, especially what you said, there are good people everywhere and we just need to, we need an opportunity to meet them and get to know them. And I think it does give yeah. us a broader view of our world. So, Dr. Winter, where all have you been? Different countries that yeah. I visited? Yeah. Well, I've been pretty much all over Western Europe. Not every place, but almost. Uh, I've been to Israel um, in the Middle East. And uh, I've been to uh, Taiwan, to China, to Korea to um, Vietnam on different, yeah. when I say missions, I don't mean that in the sense of religious missions, but doing different things, you yeah. know. They, they were all um, intentional visitations. It wasn't as a tourist. As a matter of fact, I don't think I've ever been anywhere as a tourist. I went to Dumas once. <laughs> yeah, that <doesn't> count. <laughs> that, that, good luck. But anyway, that's kind of like study abroad. Uh, but, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I, I love Dumas. It's, it's a, I, I really do. I, uh, these Small towns in Texas, these rural communities are the glue of the Texas panhandle. Yeah. I will tell you about one student that Marty and I had. When we took him to England, he had not only never left the panhandle, he had never been on an airplane yeah. before. Yep, had the same thing. You know, and so, man, it was just an eye-opening experience, and I loved that, and I know you yeah. did too, seeing these kids that are, you know, from Shamrock or Wheeler, and, uh, and then we're taking them to Oxford and Liverpool, you know. Well, this happened to me. I don't mean to interrupt, uh, Randy, but it's the same thing. And I have to tell you how this happened because it was remarkable. Uh, I'm only going to use the gentleman's first name. I know his whole name, and I'm, you'll see why. But his first name was Robert. And uh, we had a dining room that had a big fireplace in it in the basement of this monastery. I say it was a basement. It was the first floor, but it was, it was uh, well, anyway, first floor of the monastery. I had nice windows in it and everything, and that's where we ate every day. And... Uh, one day I went down there and Robert, we'd been probably in country three or four days. So it was, people were still getting settled in and so on and so forth. And Robert, I almost said his last name, was standing in front of the fireplace with his overcoat on and looked forlorn. I mean, he just was kind of crestfallen. I didn't know what was going on with him. I said to him, Robert, what's going on? He said, well, he said, I'm, I'm homesick. I said, don't feel bad about that. I'm homesick myself. I've lived a lot of different places. I've traveled to different places. But every time I go to a new place, I I long for something that's more familiar to me. Uh, It's just natural. And so we talked for a while. And he he told me, he said, uh, I asked him, I said, is this your first out trip out of the country? He said, this is my first trip out of the country. It's my first trip out of Texas. It's my first trip on an airplane. He said, this is a lot of firsts for me. Mm Mm-hmm. Anyway, we talked, we laughed a little bit about it. He stayed and did fine. Everything turned out to be fine. Well, this was 1984. 1994, 10 years later, I'm at an architect's convention in Boston, Massachusetts, and somebody taps me on the shoulder. It's Robert, and Robert, uh, he said, do you remember me? I said, I do, Robert. I don't remember everybody, but I remember you because you had a moving experience over there. He said, I'll tell you something, best experience I've ever had in all my life was getting to a place where I wasn't comfortable. And I was always comfortable, and this place made me a little uncomfortable. And I, I, that's, I know that's what Marty is talking about. We get to see some other things. And one of the things we find out, there's these vast differences in uh, kind of culture and human behavior and so on and so forth on the one hand. On the other hand, they're fairly small differences when you get right down to it. I don't care where you are. Mother-in-law jokes are funny. I don't care what nationality, <laughs> what language people speak. They're funny. Um, uh, fathers and mothers are committed to their children. You know, they want to see their children do mm-hmm. well and prosper mm-hmm. and so on. They want to see the next generation be better than the last generation. 
you know, their generation. And those common traits, I think, are very powerful. And you can only know them when you get outside yourself. Well, one of the things I love about where we work here at West Texas A&M University is that if a student really, really, really wants to travel abroad, we will make it happen for them. We'll find a way. Mm -hmm. So I also, uh, Dr. Winler and our guest, Curveball, this one I don't think is that tough. Since we, since we are kind of talking about studying abroad, I would like to hear from each one of you, what's the most foreign place you've been? What, where, where you felt you were most furthest from home? Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Mm, probably Egypt. Yeah, why? Egypt, it was, I don't know, it's just, uh, you know, different. As, well, it was different. It was so so hot and dry, and humid. Yeah. But uh, it was it was, and then all the old you know centuries old architecture, the pyramids, all these things, the uh, the uh, just the the I don't know my the way things were done is yeah is I'd love to go different. there. I'd love to go there. When yeah. were you there? Uh, I was there in about 90, 95, maybe. Yeah. Dr. Wonder, what about you? What's the most foreign place you've been? I would probably say North Vietnam and Hanoi. Uh, yeah. It was a very, uh, it was very interesting between the North and the South. South Vietnam and Ho Chi Minh City, or what we would call Saigon, uh, it was, uh, it was, uh, I was there when John McCain was running for president which made it a kind of an interesting time to be there because the South Vietnamese people loved John McCain. Really? Yeah, because he was a, he was a kind of a, a kind of a cowboy. I mean, he was tough. He had ideas. He was, uh, they considered to be very brave. You know, he withstood all He was all POW those, there. In, in, in Hanoi. Yeah. And I, I saw where he, what the cell he was in, actually, mm. in Hanoi, the so-called Hanoi Hilton, because I was staying in the real Hanoi Hilton, well, maybe that was the real one, but I was staying in the one with, with servants and, you know, all that sort of stuff right around the corner from the, the prison. It's right in the middle of town, which was all strange. It was just a juxtaposition. And all these people on motor scooters, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. like like uh, swarms of bees, you know, it would all stop and then it would all go again. And people were going in every different direction. I just it just seemed like uh, just wild to me. Yeah. And uh, and very kind of conflicted uh, culture because they were deeply there were many both in the north and the south deeply uh, freedom loving kind of people and all that and a lot of people there were were statists you know they wanted the state to kind of take care of them and so on and so forth especially in North Vietnam but it was just interesting. Well, one of the just things I, I've noticed about traveling abroad is I always come home come home feeling fortunate. And it reminds me how good we have it here at home. So, uh, an- another thing that uh, I think students learn when they travel. Do. Randy, just let me mention one other thing, and I don't want to, I know we're on a time frame here. Um, one of the values of having international students on the campus is that they bring their culture with them and share it with people. Marty said it before, you know, to get people outside the Texas Panhandle just to see the larger world. Well, if we bring 200 international students to campus and we start to rub shoulders with them, we begin to get a little international experience right here in the Texas Panhandle. And it really is, I think, very important to to welcome those students, you know, when we can and when it's appropriate and all that sort of stuff, because they do bring their culture with them yeah. to, to um, help us see, in a sense, again, outside of ourselves. All right. Well, I sure appreciate both of you and I have enjoyed our conversation today. Uh, Uh, We also appreciate you listening to what we have to say today, and we're asking you to join us again next time here on Reflections from WT, the heart and the soul of the Texas Panhandle. We'll see you then. 